Hey, this is Dave DeCamp from Antiwar.com. This is Antiwar News for Thursday, February 8th, 2024. All right, the first story at the top of Antiwar.com today. The U.S. kills a high-ranking Kateb Hezbollah commander. So a U.S. drone strike targeting a vehicle in Baghdad on Wednesday killed three members of Kitab Hezbollah, including a a high-ranking commander, and this is the latest U.S. escalation in Iraq. So Kitab Hezbollah, we've been covering them quite a bit lately. They're a Shia militia in Iraq. They're one of the bigger militias, um, and they are part of the Popular Mobilization Forces, which is a coalition of Iraqi militias that was founded in 2014 to fight ISIS. Kateb Hezbollah has been around since 2003, since the U.S. invasion of Iraq. But the PMF, which is part of Iraq's security forces, part of the Iraqi military, and that's who the U.S. is uh, killing and and bombing here. Um, So a PMF official identified the slain Kateb Hezbollah commander as Abu Bakir al-Sadi, And U.S. Central Command released a statement confirming that the U.S. was behind the drone strike. When this news first broke, it wasn't clear. I mean, I think it was pretty obvious that it was a U.S. drone strike, but there wasn't any comment from the U.S. at the time. So CENTCOM said the assassination was in response to attacks on U.S. troops in the region. The command claimed that al-Sadi was responsible for attacks on U.S. troops. CENTCOM said that its forces, quote, conducted a unilateral strike in Iraq in response to the attacks on U.S. service members, killing a Kateb Hezbollah commander responsible for directly planning and participating in attacks on U.S. forces in the region, end quote. And of course, you know, they're not going to show us any evidence of these allegations. We're just supposed to take the U.S. military's word for it. And this drone strike has outraged a lot of people inside Iraq, and it sparked protests near the U.S. embassy in Baghdad, And according to AP, Iraqi security forces have closed off Baghdad's green zone, which is where most of the foreign embassies and, you know, diplomatic missions are located. Uh, And there there were protesters, you know, there was calls for protesters to storm the U.S. embassy. Doesn't look like anything like that happened yet, but this really angers a lot of people inside Iraq. Going back to 2020, when the U.S. killed Soleimani, the Iranian Quds Force commander, Right before that, at the end of December 2019, there was a rocket attack on a U.S. base in Kirkuk, Iraq, that killed a U.S. contractor and and injured some troops. The U.S. blamed that on Kateb Hezbollah and killed a few dozen of them. Pretty pretty serious airstrikes. And then after that, the U.S. embassy in Baghdad was stormed by people, you know, These weren't just militants. These are people, you know, there's a lot of people in Iraq that have good reason to be angry at the United States and want them to leave. And so it was after that they killed Soleimani and they claimed that he was planning some sort of other attacks. But, you know, of course, there was never any evidence for that. The Trump administration actually changed a few times their reasoning for killing Soleimani. Um, But anyway, another important detail about that, that original rocket attack that killed the American contractor, there was never any evidence that it was, you know, the U.S. never showed evidence that it was Kateb Hezbollah. Could have been them, but it also, uh, Scott Horton interviewed an Iraqi journalist at the time, and Iraq's intelligence said that it was more likely ISIS. It was in an area where ISIS was still active, um, so it could have been ISIS. Uh, anyways, but that's what really started the, the, the series of escalations that led to the U.S. killing Soleimani. Um, and before that, this is another thing me and Scott spoke about the last time I was on his show. In the summer of 2019, Israel launched some airstrikes in Iraq against the Shia militias. And it was because of that that the attacks started on U.S. bases in the region. So, you know, there's always, you know, it's not surprising in these scenarios to see that there's an escalation from Israel or the U.S. that you just never hear about uh, in the media. Um, so anyway, this this drone strike came a few days after the u.s launched that heavy bombing campaign on friday in syria and iraq which killed about 40 people in both countries um so this this could be part of it and then there was also 
the attacks on U.S. bases continued after that, and there was the one the other day where the six Kurdish fighters were killed. Um, Kitab Hezbollah did say that they were suspending military operations against the U.S. before Biden launched those big airstrikes. Um, you know, that was after the three U.S. troops were killed in Jordan. But this could, you know, this is not going to be over after this airstrike. Um, you know, I think a lot besides just Kitab Hezbollah and the PMF, a lot of people in Iraq are going to be very angry about this. Remember, the U.S. was on the same side as Kitab Hezbollah uh, when they fought the big battles against ISIS. Um, so anyway, the next one here, Israeli airstrikes kill several civilians in Syria. So Israel continues to bomb Syria with impunity and targeted the western Syrian city of Homs with airstrikes that flattened a building in a residential neighborhood early Wednesday morning, killing several civilians. Syria's Sana News Agency said that a number of civilians were killed and injured, but did not specify how many. A military source said, quote, the aggression led to the martyrdom and injury of a number of civilians and some material losses to public and private property, end quote. So the UK-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said that a total of 11 people were killed in the Israeli attack, including seven civilians, Although the number is not confirmed, they kind of they can change their numbers, but they're the only ones putting out an actual number. They're also saying that two members of Hezbollah, Le, you know, Lebanese uh, Hezbollah members, were killed in this attack. And it looks like again it targeted a residential neighborhood. Uh, Israeli missiles also hit targets outside of the city in the countryside. So. Israel has been bombing Syria for years and years and has significantly stepped up these airstrikes since October 7th. And in a few cases, they have killed several members of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC. And that really risks, you know, provoking a big war. Um, an IRGC advisor. So this was something I missed. I, you know, someone mentioned this to me and then I kind of forgot about it and I didn't see anything on it. But it got overshadowed by the U.S. airstrikes. So, so this past Friday... Before the U.S. launched all those airstrikes in Iraq and Syria, Israel bombed Damascus, Syria, and apparently killed an IRGC advisor. So they killed an Iranian. Now, when the U.S. launched its airstrikes, they said they were targeting the IRGC and its affiliated, you know, militias, the the affiliated militias. Uh, but there's no sign that the U.S. airstrikes actually actually killed Iranians, because um, of course that would be a huge risk of escalation. But who knows what's going to happen next? And Israel certainly has the, the motive. Netanyahu certainly has the motive to provoke a big war here. Um, so we might, you know, we're going to keep seeing Israeli airstrikes in Syria and Lebanon as well. Uh, all right. So the next one here, Netanyahu rejects an offer from Hamas for a hostage deal. So Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has rejected a counter offer from Hamas on a potential hostage deal, insisting that he will settle for nothing less than total victory. So according to Middle East Eye, Hamas proposed a 135-day ceasefire in three 45-day phases with the goal of reaching a permanent truce. During the first phase, Hamas would release all the women, children, elderly, and sick Israeli hostages that remain in Gaza. And when it comes to the women, the ones that were not soldiers. And then in exchange, they want Israel to release all the Palestinian women, children, sick and elderly prisoners over 50 years old from Israeli prisons and an additional 1,500 Palestinian prisoners. They're asking for a lot of Palestinian prisoners to be released. I know in one case, I, I want to say it was in 2011. I might not have the year right. Hamas had a captive Israeli soldier and they got over 1,000 Palestinian prisoners for just the one soldier. So there is a precedent for them to get a lot of Palestinians freed. But that's more for soldiers. And then throughout the next phases, Hamas would release all the Israeli soldiers and men that it still has hostage. And Israel would release an unspecified number of Palestinian prisoners during that time. So the goal by the end of the 135 days would be to reach an agreement on a permanent cessation of hostilities. So when asked if Israel has formally rejected Hamas's offer, Netanyahu said, quote, based on what they passed to us from what I've seen so far, you too would have said no, end quote. He said there's no solution besides total victory and claimed an Israeli victory is, in reach, is within reach. And of course, as I've been covering a lot lately, Hamas is not anywhere close to being 
uh, eradicated as Netanyahu says he wants them to be. They're popping up back in the north. Um, so Israel still has a very long, long way to go. And they're certainly struggling when it comes to the, the fighting on the ground. They're not having trouble, you know, decimating neighborhoods and blowing the place up. But Hamas has all these tunnels. They have a lot of resources down there and, and Israel is not able to destroy them all or even close to destroy them, come even close to destroying them all. Um, so Netanyahu's rejection of Hamas's proposal came a day after it was revealed that Israel believes 30 out of the 136 Israeli hostages inside Gaza are dead. And he's still saying there's no, you know, military is the only way, it's the only solution, the only way to free them, but obviously the risk of just killing more of them uh, is very high. All right, so the next one here, Saudi Arabia rebukes U.S. comments on Israel normalization. So Saudi Arabia released a statement on Wednesday rebuking a U.S. comment on the possibility of Israel-Saudi normalization. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby said the U.S. received positive feedback during talks with Saudi Arabia about a normalization deal with Israel. But Riyadh released a statement rejecting his comments and saying that the kingdom would normalize with Israel only if the Palestinians get a state. So this statement says, quote, regarding the discussions between the kingdom of Saudi Arabia and the United States of America on the Arab-Israeli peace process, and in light of what has been attributed to the UN, to the sorry, to the U.S. National Security Council spokesperson, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs affirms that the position of kingdom of Saudi Arabia has always been steadfast on the Palestinian issue and the necessity that the brotherly Palestinian people obtain their legitimate rights. The kingdom have, has communicated its firm position to the U.S. administration that there will be no diplomatic relations with Israel unless an independent Palestinian state is recognized on the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital and that the Israeli aggression on the Gaza Strip stops and all Israeli occupation forces withdraw from the Gaza Strip, end quote. So, uh, pretty strong statement from the Saudis, definitely for, you know, PR purposes here. Uh, but I think it is clear that this, you see these Biden officials all talking about their vision for like a post-war um Gaza is, oh, you know, they'll normalize, Israel will no normalize with Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia, you know, the, they'll pay for the reconstruction and, and that'll be that. But, you know, that's just a pipe dream at this point, especially because you have the Saudis saying two-state solution and Netanyahu saying, nope, there's never going to be a two-state solution. And they also said, you know, the 1967 borders, which would require the 500,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank to leave. So, of course, that's not something Netanyahu or really uh, anybody in the Israeli government is going to be willing to do. So one thing about the Saudis is that before October 7th, it did seem like they were actually moving toward a normalization deal with Israel and that they were just going to, you know, they always said that it would they would need a two-state solution with the Palestinians. But according to all these reports that were coming out at the time, the Saudis' main priority was actually getting a defense agreement with the U.S. They wanted kind of like a NATO Article 5 style mutual uh, security guarantee from the U.S. and that the Palestinian issue was not really a priority. Um, so, but obviously, October 7th and the Israeli slaughter of Palestinians has changed, you know, the calculations, of course. All right, so the next one here, the IDF opens a probe of October 7th friendly fire deaths. This article is from Connor Freeman at the Libertarian Institute. And so the Israeli military apparently has opened an investigation. They said that they launched a probe into friendly fire deaths and possible breaches of law during fighting in, in Israel, which occurred in response to the October 7th Hamas attack and in its immediate wake. Several reports in Israeli media have indicated multiple civilians were killed by Israeli military fire. Haaretz says the investigation will focus primarily on an incident in Kibbutz Beri where a house holding more than a dozen Israeli civilians and their Hamas captives was shelled by an Israeli tank, leaving one survivor. A hostage who was released from the house by a Hamas fighter as well as the single survivor of the tank attack have confirmed this story. Um, so it says that they're operating, you know, they're having a fact-finding and assessment mechanism to examine these reports. And, you know, we'll see if they really go through with this right now. 
uh, especially with Net- I know Netanyahu doesn't really want any reflection on what happened on October 7th or what happened leading up to it. But uh, one thing uh, Connor mentions is that recent investigation from Ynet, the Israeli media outlet, that said the Hannibal Directive was ordered on October 7th or in the day, you know, and in, in the days immediately afterwards when they were still fighting Hamas in southern Israel. And the Hannibal Directive is a notorious secretive Israeli protocol, military protocol that basically was uh, do everything you can to prevent an Israeli soldier from being taken hostage, even if you have to put their life in danger, basically, you know, even if you have to kill them. Um, so that report said that they put this into effect for the Israeli civilians that Hamas was trying to get back into Gaza. So we know about the Kibbutz Berry, the tank shelling killed people there. And also all these cars that Hamas was driving back to Gaza got lit up by Israeli helicopters. And it's not clear how many Israelis were civilians were killed in those in those uh, in those instances. All right, so the next one here, Congress attacks UNRWA over baseless Israeli accusations. So this is another one from the Libertarian Institute. This is from Kyle Anzalone. And so Congress, even though, you know, we basically know now that Israel had this intelligence dossier accusing some employees of for UNRWA, the UN's Palestinian Relief Agency, of taking part in the Hamas attack. They said 12 of their employees did. Uh, the media outlets that got a hold of this intelligence said that there's no evidence that it's, you know, they don't prove anything. Uh, but the U.S. cut funding, saying that they cut funding temporarily. So in this big $118 billion bill that President Biden wants passed in there, it would actually cut funding to UNRWA permanently. Uh, so that's something that they are... Uh, trying to do uh congress is trying to do because of these israeli allegations and this is as you know hundreds of thousands of palestinians are starving to death all right so the next one here um u.s oh sorry i skipped one parents desperate to find diapers and baby formula in gaza so this article is from ap and sometimes i think it's just important to kind of read stories you know from individual Palestinians on the ground and kind of the things that they're dealing with. And this is about parents with very young babies, and it's just very horrific. So Zanab El Zain was forced to make a desperate decision, feed her infant daughter solid foods that her tiny body may not be able to digest or watch her starve because of a lack of baby formula in the besieged Gaza Strip. Al Zain chose to give two and a half, two and a half month old so only two and and a half months old. I mean that. Just thinking about this, uh, and and her name is Linda. So she chose to give her solids, knowing that the choice could lead to health is- issues. She said, "I know we were doing something harmful to her, but there is nothing." And said that she cries and cries constantly. Um, so of course, this war has sparked a humanitarian catastrophe, and there's. Young children and their parents with diapers and formula are either hard to find or spiking to unaffordable prices, leading parents to resort to inadequate or unsafe alternatives. I mean, imagine I have a five-month-old right now. I I can't imagine trying to give him solid foods. Um, It's just, you know, being a parent of a young baby, it's it's hard enough. And, and, you know, this is, you can really sympathize when you really think what, what it's like for these people. So this woman is living in a tent on the street she's been displaced from her home uh she's probably been displaced multiple times now that israel said okay evacuate the north to khan yunus now evacuate khan yunus and these are the things that they are uh dealing with and in rafa in the south um there's over a million palestinians basically living on the street Um, and they quote somebody else who says that they sold their children's food so they could buy diapers um things are really increasing so it's just the prices here are just just crazy for these parents um, that are just stuck in this horrific situation. All right, so the next one here, uh, U.S. military advisors sent to islands on China coast. So this story is insane. So uh, TVBS, which is a Taiwanese uh, news station, TV news station, they have reported that U.S. military advisors have been deployed to Kinmen, which is a group of small islands that are controlled by Taiwan but are located just off the coast 
of mainland China. And when I say just off the coast, I mean just off the coast. If you see this map here, it gives you the perspective of where um, Kinmen is related to mainland China. I mean, it's right on the coast. And this is a story I logged on to Twitter or X this morning, and I saw this, um, people tweeting about this, and I said, no, there's no way that's right. The people aren't that crazy. So then I saw this report in TVBS, and that's what it was based on. The tweets were based on, and I actually found an English language story that they have on it. And I said, let me ask the Pentagon, see what they say. And they replied to me actually pretty quickly. Uh, and they said that they could not comment on military operations in Taiwan. And that's kind of a stock answer that you get from the Pentagon. I've gotten that answer from them before when asking about U.S. military operations in Taiwan. But what it's not is it's not a denial. I asked them specifically, can you confirm that there are U.S. military advisors in Kinmen, right on the coast of mainland China? That's something if they weren't doing it, you would think that they would want to say, no, you know, that's a false report, but gave me this kind of, no, we don't comment on that. And this is the same thing they told me when the U.S. deployed about 200 troops to Taiwan last year, the same comment. And that's basically, you know, been confirmed because it that's how this stuff with Taiwan, you know, that's how we find out about it is through the Taiwanese media reports because the U.S. and Taiwan don't want to officially announce this type of cooperation. But anyway, I'll read a little bit that the, the uh, Pentagon spokesman who got back to me said, quote, we don't have a comment on specific operations, engagements or training. But I would highlight that our support for and defense relationship with Taiwan remains aligned against the current threat posed by the People's Republic of China. Our commitment to Taiwan is rock solid, end quote. So when we talk about military advisors in Taiwan, that usually means U.S. Special Operations Forces. Uh, a lot of times they send Green Berets. Um, so that's what we're talking about here. There's no, it didn't say how many of the advisors. There could just be a few dozen, but the fact that they're on Kinmen is crazy. These islands, some of these islands are only 2.5 miles away from mainland China, from Xiamen, which is a major Chinese city that's right there. If you see pictures of these islands uh, on our front page right now, is the picture story is one of the Kinmen Islands, and you can see the skyline of Xiamen, the, the Chinese city that's spelled X I A. M-E-N, I believe, Shaman. You could see the the skyline there. That's how close they are. And, you know, at some points it's like five miles away, but it's basically all within five miles. You know, three miles from the coast here, two, two and a half miles here. It's just really crazy. And there's been, uh, during the 1950s, there was the first and second Taiwan Strait crisis, crises and that was when Mao Mao's forces attacked the Kinmen Islands and, and other areas, but especially the second Taiwan Strait crisis, there was very heavy artillery shelling of the Kinmen Islands, and the U.S. you know sent Navy their, the Navy into the Taiwan Strait. And actually, before Daniel Ellsberg died, one of the last things that he leaked, he had this information about how the U.S. actually came really close to nuking China during the second Taiwan Strait crisis over these little islands. So in the future, if there ever is, if China ever does decide to make a move or, you know, let's say they want to do something short of actually invading Taiwan, but they want to send a message to the U.S. like, hey, we're not messing around anymore. You know, you're going too far. You know, moving on the Kinmen Islands is something that they could do. And if there's U.S. Green Berets there, I mean, that there's a tripwire for, for war right there. So it's just really crazy. And again, based on this report from Taiwanese media, and it wasn't denied by the Pentagon. Um, so this report, the TVBS report, said that they were sent to Kinmen for long-term stations, so it sounds like a long-term deployment, and that they were based at Taiwanese military amphibious camps. Advisors were also sent to Peng Yu, which is an archipelago about 30 miles west of the main island of Taiwan, so on the other side of the Taiwan Strait, basically. The report said that the deployment fulfilled the U.S.'s 2023 National Defense Authorization Act, which called for the U.S. to increase training for Taiwan. The 2024 NDAA, that's for this year, that's the military spending bill for this year that Biden signed into law in December, that required the Pentagon to establish a comprehensive training program for the Taiwanese military. 
And the U.S. has significantly increased its military and diplomatic support for Taiwan in recent years, uh, really ratcheting up tensions with China. So this is all being done in the name of deterrence, but it's just making war more likely. And that was put on display. You know, when we're talking about Taiwan, it's not just the military support. It's also the diplomatic support and, and, you know, things like that that actually really anger China, arguably more than the military stuff. And that was really put on display when Nancy Pelosi went over to Taiwan when she was still the House Speaker in August 2022, despite all these warnings from China, just a total PR trip for her. And China launched its largest ever military drills around Taiwan. They fired missiles over the island for the first time. They did that because Nancy Pelosi went there. So it shows how sensitive this is for them. And now there's U.S. troops right on China's coast, right there. All right, so the next one here. So this is a story about people who live in Kinmen. Uh, it's actually from CNN, and it's it's a little old. It's from last summer, but I thought it was interesting to run under that story about the U.S. sending troops there because this story is about how the people who live in Kinmen, they want to turn the area into a bridge between China, between mainland China and, and Taiwan. And the local council, you know, local um, officials there want to actually make it a demilitarized zone. Um, and again, so it's a place where, you know, mainland Chinese can go and just as a as a way to try to, you know, ease tensions and, and keep the peace. So that's what the people who live there want. And now you have the U.S. sending uh, troops there. So I just thought it's an interesting story. Um, and, you know, they interview a lot of people that live there and talk about the history of the Taiwan Strait you know, crisis and, and all that. Um, and somebody on Twitter pointed out to me that Martha's Vineyard is this the equal, an equal distance. No, actually, Martha's Vineyard is further away from the coast of the U.S., from the coast of Massachusetts than Kinmen is to mainland China. So think about that. Um, all right, so the next one here, the last story, the Senate votes down the $118 billion military aid and border bill. So, this is good news. They're still fighting. The Senate on Wednesday voted down this big bill, uh, and it was after Republican leadership came out against the legislation. So the the bill needed 60 votes to pass, and it failed in a vote of 49 to 50. Only four Republicans voted in favor, and only five Democrats voted against it. So Senate Democrats are furious with Republicans because this was a deal that they made with Republicans on, on the border policies. Now the Republicans are saying that it's not doing enough to crack down on the border and, and migration. Um, so now Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader Democrat, is trying to push through a $95 billion bill that will just include the military aid. So that means the $60 billion for Ukraine, the $14 billion for Taiwan, the four point eight no, sorry, $14 billion for Israel, and the $4.8 billion for Taiwan and other spending in that region. So there's a vote scheduled for Thursday. That's going to need 60 votes as well. It's not clear if that's going to pass, but I think it has a chance of passing. So we'll see what happens on Thursday. And then who knows what, if, what would happen with that in the House. But now Republicans are trying to get some sort of deal that they'll vote on separate border things if they, if they vote on the just the military aid bill. I still think Israel and Ukraine, they're eventually going to get the money, but it is taking uh, quite a while. All right, so that's it for the news for today. Please go check out our viewpoints. We have one from Jeremy Scahill, Netanyahu's War on Truth. One from Jeffrey Sterling, A Visit to Julian Assange in Prison. One from Ramsey Baroud, Breaching the Iron Wall, How Palestinians Crushed Jabotinsky's Century-Old Ideas. One from Lenny Breutman at his substack, Chaos in the Red Sea. And one from Hunter Dorensis, What Does It Mean to Be American First? That's over at the American Conservative. Definitely go check that out. Um, but that's it for me for today. One more show for this week. You can always support us by sharing antiwar.com. Tell your friends, subscribe, like, and all that. All that stuff I always tell you to do. Uh, but I'll be back tomorrow with some more news. Thanks for listening.